please. Shh. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. All right, you guys ready to talk a little baseball? The Bulls aren't very good. We saw that last night. The Blackhawks are really good, 12 in a row. And, and, and you know, last year we were standing up here, and the, the Cubs were coming off a 73-win season and had no idea what was going to happen in 2015. So uh, the Cubs-White Sox rivalry is going to get put on the back burner tonight. And you White Sox fans are probably happy about that because last year – the Cubs won 97 games. 97. The White Sox won, how many can tell me? 76. Well, who said 20? It seemed like that at some point. 76, 76. But tonight we put the White Sox and Cubs rivalry again on the back burner because it's all about uh, the Cardinals tonight and the Royals, of course, but the Cubs Cardinals having grown up in central Illinois I despise this man. I was a Cubs fan growing up, and he made my Cubs look bad for a lot of years. So it's nice to be able to come here tonight uh, and uh, interview or introduce him, and we'll be getting to him in just a couple of moments, Mr. Whitey Herzog. We do have some corporate sponsors we'd like to thank. Folks, we have the best businesses in, in, in all of Chicagoland. Whenever there's an event like this, several people step up, as always. Thanks to uh, Avenue Management, the Clarion Hotel. Let's give the staff a nice round of applause. Nice job. As always, Darcy Buick, GMC sponsors, of course, uh, as always, everything, Deconstruction, First Community Bank, Illinois Licensed Beverage Association, Will and Grundy Counties, Imperial Construction Associates, Jim Sefcik, the Kiwanis Club of Joliet, KSKJ Life, Lakeshore Beverage, that's Budweiser, Mickey's Oil Company, Mickey's Tire and Service Centers, Moran Athletic Club, Northern Illinois Steel, PT Ferro Construction, t Funeral Home, and Turk Furniture. Let's hear it for all of our corporate sponsors. And in your book, too, there's way too many to, uh, to point out, but we have a Hall of Fame sponsors, MVP sponsors, Cy Young Awards, and All-Stars, so thanks to all those folks as well. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for you guys, the Will County Old Timers wouldn't be around doing this for now some nearly seven decades. Thanks to all the businesses who donated the silent auction items and the raffle prizes as well. We do still have some, are we done with 50-50? I think we are done with 50-50. We'll draw that coming up here in, in just a little bit. We do have one reminder, if, if tonight won't give you your fix enough on baseball, next Thursday night at the University of St. Francis, it's their annual Brown and Gold Night, and all you Cubs fans are out there, I know you're still shy to show your face because you're usually outnumbered about four to one at the Old Timers Banquet. Uh, Jed Hoyer is going to be speaking. Tickets are on sale for $50, 740-3464. You get a chance to meet the Cubs general manager and vice president of baseball operations at the University of St. Francis next week, which is what's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun talking Cubs baseball this year. We would like to introduce the head table. Before we do that, let us bring up the Honorable Mayor of the City of Joliet, Mayor Bob Odekirk. Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Good, good evening. Uh, thank you to the old timers for this wonderful event that they put on every year. I think the best thing about this event is that you know spring is coming. We're only a couple months away and baseball's coming. So thank you, old timers. Thank you for what you do, uh, supporting youth baseball in our community. And thanks to all of you. Welcome. Thank you for supporting this, uh, this event and youth baseball. Mr. Herzog, welcome to Joliet. Thank you. And a special welcome and thank you. Uh, my, my brother Brian is here with his partner, Paul Hinkhouse. They are, jo are St. Louis City Police Officers who answered a call, did a favor, and drove Whitey up here tonight to be with us. They're going back tomorrow. So thank you, guys, and welcome to Joliet. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And I heard they have some great stories. That Whitey, glove, Whitey unrated the four-hour drive up here, right? Heard it was really good. Heard you're funny. So we'll see here in just a little bit. All right, uh, this is tradition. I mean, Will County Old Timers Baseball is all about tradition. And this young lady coming up here with a little bit of a tune. Some of you younger folks may not know this, but uh, Rita Matichek's been around for several years performing this for the old timers. So let's bring up Rita for one tune. Rita Matichek with my buddy. Rita! Yes, I have been around for a long time.
time and i'm so glad i'm on the right side of the grass that's all i can tell you but speaking of the right side of the grass we're remembering uh, this evening so many wonderful wonderful people that i've known all my lifetime and many of you have known too who have passed on so we must always remember them never forget them and so we do this this special little song called my buddy nights are long since you went away i think about you all through the day my buddy my buddy nobody quite so true miss your voice the touch of your hand to let me know that you understand my buddy my buddy your body misses you. Amen. Thank you, Rita. Whitey just said Rita could sing good night to him anytime. <laughs> two ladies in here tonight, and you're hitting on both of them, Whitey. I like that. Very good. All right, I'm going to introduce the head table. To my left is the president of the old-timers, retired high school baseball coach, state champion head coach, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jim Hall. And the aforementioned ladies' man, Whitey Herzog. The retired major league umpire legend, Leg legend my ass is what Whitey just said. You can't say anything up here without me repeating it, Whitey. It's what I do for a living. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Howler. <laughs> my ass, that was good. P security. Past president, old timers, Jimmy Greenan. And she's all of our buddies. She's Rita Matichak. Another round of applause for Rita. And the chairman of the Old Timers Membership Committee, Mr. Tom Hare. Thanks, Tom. To my right, Marty Terlop, the vice president of the Old Timers. Marty. The mayor of Joliet, Mr. Bob Odekirk. Past President, Sports Editor, Herald News, Mr. Dick Goss. <laughs> Father's gone. Had to perform service somewhere. Okay? And last but not least, to our left, where did my sheet go? Here's my sheet, Marty. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Sefcik, Vice President, Polk County Old Timers Baseball. Thanks. All right, we have, as part of tradition, that's what this is all about, tonight's tonight, the old-timers get to honor some incredible performances and incredible individuals from last year. Let's bring up Dick Goss from the Herald News and from the old-timers to honor our girls' players of the year and our boys' players of the year. Dixie. Okay, Scott, thank you very much. Another great year in local baseball and softball last spring, and... Uh, Tonight, uh, maybe, maybe it's because Whitey was going to be here to speak, we, uh, we're honoring a couple of great leadoff hitters. Whitey, you, you ought to enjoy that. They, but uh, we also a couple of great pitchers. So let's get started with uh, the softball player of the year, Jennifer Ames of Joliet West. Jen. Yeah, Jen is now uh, playing ball down at uh, Eastern Illinois University, so she's not with us, but her coach, Heather Suka, is on the way up. Jen was a 439 hitter with uh, 34 runs batted in, 32 runs scored last year. Excellent fielder at second base and very fast base runner. What's amazing about her, though, Whitey, is in a high school softball season, 13 home runs from the leadoff spot. 
So congratulations, Jen, and here's Heather Suka, her coach, to talk about her for a minute. I'd like to say thank you to the Old Timers Association for this award. Jen was very grateful when I told her about it. Um, I would also like to thank her parents, Pauline and Ray, for all their time and support over the years. I know that Jen and her younger sister, who is currently still playing for me, would both credit their success to both of them. Last but not least, I'd like to also acknowledge Jen's summer ball coaches, whom she could not praise more, Ryan and Becky. Uh, thank you so much for all your time and dedication over the years. I've had the great pleasure of coaching Jen for four years on varsity. I truly enjoyed watching her grow as a person and an athlete to become the person she is today. She truly excelled in her junior and soft senior year with all state, all area, and all conference recognition both years. And Dick already said her stats for her senior year for 39 batting average, 31 RBIs, and 13 home runs. But in addition to her outstanding offense, her range at second base was incredible. One of the best I've seen in high school over the last 10 years. And she was also a true leader for a team and a role model for our younger players. Uh, despite her incredible work ethic, enthusiasm for the game, and all her talent, she did struggle with one thing, punctuality. You would often find her running after Saturday morning practices, not only during her freshman year, but her sophomore year and her junior year. Finally, her senior year, she was able to make it to every single obligation on time. As much as I would like to take the credit for that, for her timeliness, I have the feeling it was for two other reasons. Either she was realized she was already in the best shape she possibly could be in, or her running partner, her junior year, her sister by default, had some sort of influence. Regardless of who or what has driven Jen, she has not only had an incredible high school career, but she also has completed a successful, successful first semester at Eastern Illinois. She also has a great chance of starting for them this spring. I cannot be more proud of her, and I'm honored to be here to able to expect, accept this award on her behalf. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather. Next up, we have our softball pitcher of the year. Some of you may remember that uh, Linkway East finished second in the state softball tournament. And of course, one of the big reasons that that happened is the pitcher, Nicole Van Genup, our softball pitcher of the year. Nicole finished 25 and four, struck out 236 batters in 185 innings at a 0 0.91 ERA. She also hit 431 with 35 RBIs and 940, or 549 slugging percentage. So, uh, well, let's just say she was a pretty good all-around softball player. She's now playing down at Eckerd College in Florida. I believe, uh, believe her dad, John, is here uh, tonight. I don't think her coach, Elizabeth Paul Licky, is here. John, are you here? Come on up, John. Let's let's. Congratulate Nicole in the right way. John is, John, John is a former minor league ball player himself, so uh, Nicole might have might have learned a lot from, from Dad. But uh, anyway, Linkway East had a fantastic run last year, and uh, like I said, finished second in the state. So we want to recognize Nicole as our softball pitcher of the year. You want to stay down there, John, and talk? Come on up. There's not a. We we're missing a stairwell here, I guess, for John to get up here. Here you go. Thank you. A little that I know I have to give a speech tonight. This is not my specialty, but I want to thank everybody. It was quite an honor, and I can't thank you for having us here and thinking of us. And Wadi Herzog, I'm all excited to see you. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, now we move on to the baseball front, and uh, we'll lead off with our leadoff man, Cody Gross from Joliet West, who is now playing, playing ball at Chicago State. Uh, Cody was on a varsity the last three years, and uh, his overall average for those three years was right around 500. He, uh, he was an amazing leadoff hitter, excellent shortstop, excellent fielder, 
and uh, basically never struck out. He was, he was always uh, making contact and always on base, and he was a terrific base runner. Um, his senior year, he scored 40 runs and hit 485. And um, as much as it was a, a great senior year for him, we are giving him this award as kind of a career achievement award. He, uh, he was great for three years with the Tigers varsity. John Karczewski, his coach, is here to accept the award on his behalf. John? Thank you. Uh, if Cody was standing up here right now, he'd probably have to stand on a chair. That's how short he is. Um, but this kid played big for us for three years. Um, he actually uh, got a little bit of time with us on the varsity when he was a freshman as well. So he spent four years, um, a little bit more than three years with us on the varsity. Some of his highlights in those three years, and like Dick said, it was like a three-year um, career. Uh, he, w he had a 538 on base percentage. He batted 478, 40 RBIs, 28 doubles, 55 stolen bases. He had 351 plate appearances and 15 strikeouts. And that's, again, some of the best pitchers around in the area. And um, he, his junior year was probably a better year than his senior year. He only struck out twice. And um, you couldn't keep him off the base. Um, real quiet kid. And like I said, he was just the spark plug that kept us going. Um, he was a two-time All-State uh, first team, uh, three-time Southwest Suburban Conference All-Conference, two-time Team Illinois member for Coach Hall here. Coach Hall will tell you a story. Fifteen times in a row for Team Illinois, he was on base. Um, and I know when he, was a, when he was a sophomore, I told Coach Hall, I got this kid, he's a sophomore. He's like, well, we usually only take juniors. I go, you need him. And, you know, he got him involved in that. And, you know, the kid was unstoppable from over there. So uh, Coach Hall deserves a little bit of that credit as well. Um, he was a two-time All-Area selection and now the Player of the Year for Will County. Um, Cody cannot be with us this evening, but he writes this. I would like to thank the Old Timers Baseball Organization for this award. I am truly honored and humbled to be this year's recipient. I would first like to thank my mother, Peggy, and Grandpa Frank, who are here tonight. Can you stand, please? They gave me the opportunity to play this game that I love and have showed me how important hard work is for success. I would also like to thank my teammates and especially the coaches for pushing me to do the best I could be. The Joliet West program was an honor to be a part of. The coaches did as much as they could to make opportunities possible for us as student athletes. Anything we would ask for, the coaches would try to make happen. And for that, I can't thank them enough. I had the chance to attend this banquet last year, and I remember thinking what an honor it would be to be chosen, and now I know. I am extremely thankful and appreciative to be the Will County Old Timers Player of the Year. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. All right, now we're, we have the baseball pitcher of the year. And I actually have uh, two people to call up here for this one because Drake Fellows from Joliet Catholic is a senior this year at Joliet Catholic, and he is here, and his coach Jared Voss is here. So you guys want to start moving on up here. Um, Drake finished 9-1 and one last year with one save and a 0 0.58 ERA. He allowed 44 hits and 11 walks in 73 innings. Uh, I don't know if you, if you heard that, 44 hits and 11 walks in 73 innings, and that's playing against the, some of the best high school competition you could find anywhere. He, he struck out 98 guys in those 73 innings. He throws in, the, throws in the low 90s, has an excellent breaking ball. He is committed to Vanderbilt, but uh, well, we'll see, see what the draft brings this, this, this June. But uh, anyway, congratulations, Drake, and Drake and Jared, it's all yours. Um, I know how Cody feels. I got to get on a chair to talk to Drake, uh, usually. But, um, but uh, just I want to uh, briefly just say a few things about Drake as he gets up here and, and gives his thank yous. And I know uh, Drake Dick read off some of his stats, and they're they're quite impressive. 
Um, the accolades that he's received in a short amount of time are second to none. I haven't seen too many players from this area um, honored with some of those uh, awards that he's received. And when you're that high caliber of a ball player, you're pulled in a lot of different directions. And for Drake, I think the most impressive thing through all that is the amount of the maturity um, that he's shown, um, how humble he's been through this entire process, in my opinion, is truly impressive. And it's been an honor for me to get the chance to coach him for the last two years. And I'm looking forward to his final season this spring. So here's Drake. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Voss and Goss, for that introdu introduction. I would like to thank the Will County Old Timers Baseball Association for presenting me with this award. With accepting this award, I would like to thank the people who made this possible. My parents, my high school coaches, Jared Voss, Jake Jaworski, Ryan Quigley, and Leo Mahalik. My summer coach, Rich Ruffalo, my hitting coach, Kevin Sullivan. I would also like to give a special thanks to Mark D'Alessandro, who has been my coach since I was eight years old and taught me how to play the game the right way. And I would like to thank all the other family members, friends, and teammates that have supported me throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you, Drake. Thank you, Jared. Congratulations. Now we honor the high school players. What about youth in baseball awards? Let's bring up Dan Bertino. He's got some awards to hand out. Dan? Thank you, Scott. I've got a couple different awards here tonight. Uh, get myself a little organized. There we go. We're doing something a little different this year. Uh, silver one? Okay. Basically, I'm here to uh, present the Town and Country Bowling Lades Award uh, for the Old Timers Team of the Year for 2015. And tonight, we're also going to um, present a Lifetime Achievement Award to uh, Joe and Donna Marshall for what they've done the past 37 years in youth baseball. Before that, though, I'd like to, uh, I saw George Contos out there, thank George again. It's the 18th year that I've been doing this. Uh, he never says no to anything that helps with the youth and uh, uh, town and country lanes out there. Thanks a lot, George. Next, I'd like to thank all the members, the sponsors, the patrons, and all the people that are at this banquet. These are, this is really our uh, only source of revenue that uh, we use to donate to these teams in this leagues. And as you saw, we gave $13,000 uh, away last year um, to about 27 teams. Since then, we've uh, found some ways to cut some of our costs and increase some of our revenue. So I'm believing that in April, we should be able to hit the, about the $16,000 range if everything works out like we thought. It's getting better and better. So um, now to honor the word that came to me when we looked at uh, picking uh, Crest Hill, 14-year-old Pony All-Stars. And I see him in the back out down there. There they are back there. Was the word continuously, OK? Uh, year after year, I read in the Herald News that Crest Hill Pony All-Stars are down in Kankakee winning. They're over at Crest Hill winning. They're constantly getting to the zone tournament, okay? They're continuously beating people, winning tournaments, and getting to the zone, which is very tough. And we were talking at our table over there, uh, and somebody will come up and probably correct me, but, uh, you know, we have a lot of teams in the Bronco level, the Mustang level, go to a lot of World Serieses. The only two teams I could come up with in Pony was the, the, I think the 1966 Ingalls Park team that went to California and the 93 team from St. Joe's that won it all. Um, it's a real tough bracket, okay? Now I'm certain there might have been, I don't follow everything, and if somebody wants to correct me and bring it up, that would be fine. But it's, I think, the toughest age to, uh, to get to that World Series, okay? As you can see here, they continuously state champions 2007, 2012, 2011, last year, 2015, won some tournaments, made it to the zone tournament. Uh, I wish the team would stand up back there, if they don't mind. Give them a round of applause. 
They not only represented Crest Hill, the Will County area, the state of Illinois, they've been recognized by Crest Hill by the mayor and the city council for what they've achieved. Thanks a lot, guys. You did a great job, okay? Now, this is something new. I'd like to, Joe, Joe Marshall, come up. Uh, Joe and I never met each other, but I always got to check out to him to Crest Hill. I always read in the newspaper everything he was doing. We sat down a couple times and talked about what was going on in Crest Hill. And I found out me and Joe are about the same age. We both started coaching about the same time, around 1978. I went 20 years, and that was enough. I got out. I was amazed. Joe put together, he's run the Crest Hill League now for 37 years, and we just talked about how well they're doing. He put together the uh, DuPage River Valley Conference, which was something I was thinking about in the 80s, and he was busy doing it, okay? He put a league together where Shanahan and, and uh, Belmont and St. Joe's and all the teams could play each other in a league. Then they also have, and I'm not as well versed as Joe, but a crossroads league too, where they chose other players where these players could get an extra 20 or 30 games, okay? Uh, he's the only um, commissioner of this league, and the remarkable thing is about this, and I'll bring Joe up to present these awards to him, him and his wife Donna have done this for over 37 years. Joe, I'd like you to come up to present these awards to you for your contributions to youth baseball. First is, if I can get this here, there we go, you got it. This is the Town and Country Bowling Lanes Award for the Team of the Year, of which Joe is the manager, that the old timers picked, the Crest Hill 14-year-old po uh, Pony All-Stars, okay? Joe's the manager of that team for all they did. <laughs> this award here is our first Lifetime Achievement Award that we've ever given, and I can't think of anybody that deserves it more than Joe and Donna Marshall. I'd like to present this award to you, congratulate you on 37 years and the contribution you've made to youth baseball, okay? Congratulations. There you go. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, this was our youngest uh, team that we sent to the zone in Michigan this year. Uh, we had six 13-year-olds on the team. I'm very proud of the players. Uh, the ones that are here, stand up and I'll introduce you. Jalen Sorter, Zach Wehrman, Riley McIntyre, Matt Toth, Aaron Darling, Joy Bujan. All right, I can't see anymore. Michael Mommy. My coach was Terry Weirman, and business manager was Donna Marshall. So, very proud of what we accomplished this year with a young team. Congratulations. <laughs> For the Lifetime Achievement Award, when we, uh, Donna and I started in Crest Hill, my sons were four, two, and just born. They're in the back there, Michael, Matt, and Dan. When you think about growing up at the ballpark, you think about playing ball and having fun, they worked. At a very young age, they learned how to pull weeds, work on wet diamonds, garbage, stocking concession stands. They weren't having fun, they were working. So being at the ballpark wasn't their favorite thing to do. But, uh, so they learned how to work at a very young age. I'd also like to thank the Joliet Herald News, Dick Goss, for the coverage Crest Hill and the Page River Conference Tournament has gotten over the last several years. They cover our conference tournament and our all-conference games. I'd like to thank Crest Hill Mayor Ray Solomon and the City Council. They always recognize the efforts of our teams. And my special friend and adopted father, Les Smith, who coached in our league for 25 years, was very instrumental at the beginning of Crest Hill and he hardly, rarely ever misses a game. But most of all, I'd like to thank my wife and best friend, Donna, because I would have never made 37 years without her. She does everything, I do the fun part. She does all the work. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, and congratulations once again. We have one more raffle prize. We have a suite at Silver Cross Field for the Slammers game, right, Jimmy? Okay, a suite, and the winner of the suite is Jake Ziesmer. Jake, wave your hand. Stay where you're at. Jake, I'll, I'll come see you in a little bit. Hey, Jake, stay right there. I'll come see you in a little bit. I got your information. All right. Oh, we're going to do this right now? Is that, the, is that what the winner gets? That's what, oh, that's what's in there, so half of that? Or? Oh, okay. Okay, we're going to do, you want to do 50-50 now before we bring up one? Okay. 50-50, $1,215. Where's the 50-50 uh, tickets? You got them, Pat? Let's draw one right now. Let's bring them on up. Here you go. I got it right here. We'll get out of there. All right, Jimmy, I'm going to put those on the ground and grab one of those, grab one of those tickets right out of there if you would. $1,215. The number, 0370. Oh, by the way, you have to take the money, too. Old-timers does not want this back. So don't be generous tonight. Take it. 037011. It's not the Powerball, but it's a grand. Who's got it? Winner must be present. Who won? One of the kids from the, old, from the Crest Hill baseball team? No. I don't know if that would be illegal or not. Jim, I'm going to give you this money. You can verify, and there you go. Congratulations. What's your name? Oh, Gary Woods is in the washroom. Don't tell him. Don't tell Gary that he won. What's your name? Jim Massey, the winner of the money. Way to go, Jim. All right. By the way, this, yeah, who's Gary? Tell Gary his wife called. He's got to go home. Silent auction is over. Thank you for your generosity. Okay, before we get started with Mr. Herzog, let's stretch a little bit. It's the famous seventh inning stretch. We're in the seventh inning stretch. Let's bring Rita back up here for a little take me out to the ball game. Rita Matichek. Everybody up. Come on, let's go. Okay, stretch. Here we go. Now you all have to put your own team names in when we get to a certain point, okay? All right, so here we go. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I ever get back for its root. Root, root for the oh. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Thank you, Rita. Awesome job, as always. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the main event. Basically, that's going to be it. Don't sit down, Waddy. This will be short. Ladies and gentlemen, well, these guys are having fun over here. Hey, hey, uh, hey, guys, we're gonna, hey, guys, guys, shh. we're gonna have our featured speaker up here. If you could be quiet, please. Thank you very much. I know everybody around here would appreciate it. All right, all I'm gonna say, three letters. That's all you need to say when you introduce a man who's reached the heights that Whitey Herzog has. H O F. Ladies and gentlemen, Hall of Famer Whitey Herzog. There you go, sir. Okay, listen, I before I start, I want to make it very clear that I love Cub fans. And the reason I do is because I know they're not front runners. <laughs> but I do want to say this, uh, Joe Madden. Your manager worked for me with the Angels. He's a very good friend of mine. And when I look at the uh, National League Central now, the Cardinals got their work cut out for them for the next seven, eight years. That's going to be a hell of a battle. So the Cub and Cardinal rivalry is going to be good. 
I think both of them are going to be good enough to get a wild card and a winner. I think a lot of depends on what the Mets do. If they win their division, Pittsburgh might sneak back in there again. But I do think the Chicago Cubs, from what I've seen in Arizona and Florida and the B games and the A games over the years that I've been in baseball, the Cubs have more fans than any organization in baseball. It's just amazing. Okay. You know, I'm here tonight because my good friend of Bill Howell. For years, every time I'd seen him down at Bush Stadium, he'd ask me about coming up here, and I always had something going, and I saw him there this summer. When was it? About June, I guess, you know. And we talked about coming up here, and uh, the only thing I thought about was the weather. I didn't know what it would be like, but I had two chauffeurs drive me up here today. The weather was nice. We talked all the way, and I want to tell you there was some bull flying. <laughs> but Bill Haller was one hell of an umpire. And what I liked most about him was if you had a legitimate gripe and you go out and argue with him, he'd, ha he'd let you talk. And he let you express yourself, and if you didn't use any bad words, you, he let you go back to the bench. I only had one time in the five years, Bill, that I managed Kansas City. I was arguing with Bill, not being very smart, not having a very good vocabulary. I let something fly out of my mouth that I didn't want to say. And I said, Bill, I didn't mean that. And he said, you said it, you're gone. So that was the one time he kicked me out, but uh, I, I tell you something, uh, you should be proud of him. Uh, I saw his brother Tom catching for the Giants, and uh, he'd be behind the plate. Chuck Keller, the old Giants second baseman, was my third base coach. And Bill, I know Bill and Tom talked a lot during the ball game, but Bill was really something as good as he called balls and strikes when he was back there with your brother. I mean, you should be commended for that because that's a tough situation. But, you know, the last time that I was in Jolly at Illinois was 1963. I played that season, I, I shouldn't say I played, I was a member of the Detroit Tigers. We ended the season on a Sunday afternoon and I had bought a new Ford from Ford Motor Company. I picked it up at the Rotunda. I was driving it back to Kansas City or Independence, Missouri, where I lived. I filled up with gas right outside of Joliet, got back in the car, and I put a seatbelt on. Never in my life, there was no law at that time, did I ever put a seatbelt on. I drove in through Joliet, Stopped at a red light, and when it turned green, I pulled through the red light, and a guy in a 1957 Oldsmobile 98 broadsided me. He cracked every window, he demolished the car, and it's 11 o'clock at night. And in those days, every major league ball player got a carton of cigarettes from every cigarette company every week you'd have a Carton of Camels, you have a Carton of Chesterfields, you have a Carton of Raleigh's, you had all kinds. And I had in the trunk of that car about 40 <laughs> cartons of cigarettes that I was taking home because I never did smoke. I had about 14 baths. I had some autographed balls with K Line and the whole group on there. And at 11 o'clock at night, I don't have a car. I'm in Jellyhead, Illinois and I had a hitchhike to St. Louis. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I looked like Santa Claus. I was giving cigarettes away, bats away, <laughs> balls away. I finally got down to St. Louis and I took a bus to Kansas City the next morning. That's the last time I was in, jo in uh, Joliet. Uh, it, it's amazing it's been that long. I sure as hell hope it ain't that long again before I get back here because an awful lot of nice people and a lot of great baseball fans. Uh, you know, when I look back at my career, and I've always said baseball was good to me after I quit trying to play. You've heard that before. And I was kind of a hanger-on and uh, not a great ball player, but 
When I played ball and uh, came up to the big leagues in the late 50s, and uh, we didn't make much money. We didn't even tell our roommates what our salaries were. And what bothers me today, you can't pick up a sports page anymore without reading about how much money everybody's making. And when I see what the salaries are given now, for people that aren't what I call a, an, an elite ball player, somebody that you get you to turn your club around, and you, we used to pay them for what they did, now we're starting to pay them for what we think they're gonna do. And that's not good. The other change that I see in the salary structure in the f baseball, and I'm not going about on the field right now, in the old days we had more fun. You know, we could buy a comic book for a dime, trade it all week, and I, at the end of the week I read seven comic books and spent a dime. Now you get on the bus and you're the manager, and every damn player comes by, by your seat with a Wall Street Journal. So they're looking at the stock market, they're looking at this, and I only had one time I had a ball player. I'll tell you his name because he's a great guy and probably the most popular ball player ever played in St. Louis, Willie McGee. He saw a guy behind me reading the, uh, reading the Wall Street Journal and he asked him for the sports page. <laughs> But, you know, that's where the game has changed. We don't have a sports page anymore where you've got nicknames, where you've got colorful players. And when I played, we, we were talking today, coming up here, two great baseball fans, two policemen from St. Louis drove me up here, and we were talking about Jimmy Pierce. We were talking about a lot of guys way back, and I played against Williams, uh, Mantle, and uh, so forth. And, you know, when I think about characters and, and the funny guys we used to have, I got traded from the New York Yankees uh, to the Washington Senators as a player to be named later in a Mickey McDermott deal on Easter Sunday, April 1st, 1956. I'd gone to church that evening because it was Easter with Bobby Richardson and Tony Kubek. And I came back and uh, they met me in front of the Serena Hotel and told me Casey wanted to see me. And I went up there and I'll never forget Casey'd been drinking. Now I want to tell you, if liquor kills people, there's no way Gene Autry, Casey Stengel, uh, and uh, Jugussie Bush couldn't live as long as he did. So when the doctor says about drinking, you can't believe all that because those guys were still drinking at 90 some. <laughs> But anyway, Casey told me, when, he, when I got up there, he was telling me how good I was, but he was sending me over to Washington. And he said to me, I'll never forget, he said, you're not as good as the guy I, ha I have, he said. Well, he had mantle. He, <laughs> he didn't have to, I was a center fielder, and he had mantle playing center field. I said, well, Casey, you don't have to tell me that. I know that, you know. But anyway, he and I became outstanding friends, and uh, during the years, uh, fundamentally, I, after going to a few Yankee camps and the rookie schools and stuff, he was the greatest teacher of fundamentals I'd ever seen. He taught me things that uh, I had good managers, good instructors uh, in the Yankee organization, but Casey had ideas that I'd never heard of before, and. Uh, I used a lot of that, to jump off a third, how to steal bases and how to do things. And, and uh, he, he told me one time, I don't know, for some reason, as bad a ball player as I was and just a hanger on, he told me, he kind of knew that I was going to manage in the big leagues. I got a picture of him when I was a Yankee rookie in 1956. And he says, to a great leader, if I'd have showed that to my high school teachers, they'd have thrown up. <laughs> But the thing is, he told me one time, he said, you know how to handle an interview? He said, because you're going to be interviewed a lot. He was talking about the future. And I said, what do you mean, Casey? He said, first of all, you ask the guy, how long you got? If he says 15 minutes. And you say, how many questions do you want, you want to ask me? And he tells you three. 
He said, when he asked you that first question, you talk for 15 minutes and you only get in one third of the trouble. <laughs> and you know, that's the way I've did it all my life. And I had that five minute radio show every day during the week with Jack Buck. He asked me one question, I knew it was only five minutes, I talked for five minutes. <laughs> and it was a hell of a show, everybody loved it, and Jack always asked me a good question. But, you know, the game now is altogether different. When I went to Washington and, and I got traded over there, we had a character, Scrap Iron Courtney, a catcher. He wore glasses thick as Coke bottles. And he was a catcher, and the guy, dang, he had a mask on, and he was the funniest looking catcher I ever seen. A pop-up would go up, he couldn't wait for it to come down. He'd jump up to get it, you know. But I played with him at Baltimore, I played with him at Kansas City. But I'll never forget when we came back from spring training with the Washington Senators, and uh, he thought he was a great ping pong player. And you know, he really, he was pretty good, but he didn't have a killer. He, he didn't have a smash. When we got back to the hotel after the game that afternoon, we went into the lobby of the Shoreham Hotel where we stayed till the season opened. And it says, European champ, European ping pong champ is giving an exhibition up on the rooftop. So Courtney said, well, we're going up there. So him and I and Dean Stone, who's from around here somewhere in Northern Illinois, we go up to watch this ping pong champion from Europe. Courtney watches him play. He walks over, throws a hundred dollar bill on the table, and he said, I can beat you. <laughs> this is Courtney now against the European champ. The European champ sat in a chair and beat Courtney 21 to two. <laughs> Courtney walks over and picks up the $100 bill, which he put by the net on the ping pong table, and he put it back in his pocket, and he said, you're using an illegal paddle. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he would do things like that. And, you know, then I had Yogi. You know, the greatest day, year I ever had in baseball was not managing or not playing, but the greatest year I ever had fun-wise was in 1966 when Bing Devine went over to the Mets and he hired me as a third base coach. And Yogi coached first. And uh, for some reason, uh, Yogi, because I was in the American League, I guess, and he was too, every morning when we had maybe only one night game in each city, he'd call me at 7.30 and he'd say, where are we going to eat tonight? I said, Yogi, we're going to catch a bus to the ballpark at 9.30. We'll talk about it. I'll meet you in the bar after the game. We'll figure it out. Don't leave without me. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we, we really became good friends. I had him in my dinner twice. And, and Yogi didn't think he was funny. But I want to tell you two Yogi stories. Two of the funniest stories I've ever heard. Uh, I, uh, I, I, one day, I, we had an afternoon game in Shea Stadium. And he said, what are you going to do tonight? And I said, well, go downtown and probably go to the stage and eat, maybe go to a show. Why don't you come home with me? He said, Carmel, we'll cook dinner. I said, okay. And he said, then tomorrow we'll go play golf, and then Thursday we got a night game, we'll come into the ballpark. I said, okay. So anyway, he and I go back to New Jersey where he lived. We get there about 5.30. No Carmel. Well, Yogi made us both a martini, but Yogi would take a tall glass with ice cubes and just put vodka in it and sip on the damn thing for three hours. And I was, everything I do is pretty quick. I, I mean, oh, I'm still doing it. That's one of my problems at my age. So anyway, I had about four martinis and uh, somebody, uh, well, you know, they're like women's breasts, you know that. One's not enough and three's too many and I'm on four, you know. <laughs> and 6.30, I've had about four of them. I'm telling Yogi how to hit, I'm telling Yogi how to catch. Here I am, a hanger on and Yogi's an all Hall of Famer and a really a great ball player and a great hitter. Seven o'clock, no calm. I found my fifth one. Oh, uh, all of a sudden, here comes Carm. 
she, I, Yogi said, Carm, where in the hell have you been? You were supposed to cook dinner. She said, this is a true story now. You can't make this up. She said, oh, Yogi. She said, I went to see Dr. Shivago. He said, what the hell's wrong with you now? <laughs> And that is a true story. Well, when we played in Old Shea Stadium, we didn't have nothing but a spick of the water coming out of there. We didn't have any bottled water. We didn't have any latrine or bathroom in the dugout. We had to go way up under the stands and go to the bathroom. About the fifth inning one day, I said to Yogi, I said, Yogi, hold the fort. I said, I got to run up to the bathroom. I'll be back in a few minutes. He, uh, he said, okay. So I came back down in about five minutes, and generally we don't hit that long. You know what I mean? We're hitting, and I mean, uh, the other team's hitting it. I knew that would take 20 minutes before we got three outs. But anyway, there's Yogi standing just like this. I said, Yogi, I'm back. Oh, he said, you missed it. I said, miss it? Miss what? He said, oh, well, he said, there was two streakers on the field. I said, really? I said, what were they, men or women? He said, I don't know. They had sacks over their heads. <laughs> you know, that's a true story. He didn't think that was funny. I mean, that, you, and, and you can't make that up. But, you know, when you think about baseball now and you think about it then and I haven't lost a game since 1990 <laughs> and unfortunately I haven't won any either but the big thing is the game has changed a lot because everybody's carrying 12 13 pitchers there's like a it's against the law to go nine innings and it looks like they, if the guy's got a shutout going after eight and 90 pitches they got to put the closer in and you know Bob Gibson said what well, about this here uh, quality start stuff? Six innings now. If you give a, you go six innings, give up less than three runs, that's a quality start. And he said, when I played, he said, nine inning complete game win was a quality start. That was it. And when you look back at then and now, God, Bob Gibson, before he hurt that knee, he had 257 wins for the Cardinals, but he had 280 some complete games. Just think about that. Walter Johnson one year when I used to go to Griffith Stadium when I was playing, he had a big plaque there. He had 16 shutouts one year. 16 shutouts. 390 strikeouts. I had Nolan Ryan out of high school. I was with him with the Angels. I was with the Mets when we traded him. When they called me to contact Leroy Stanton that he said he traded to Leroy Stanton for Jim Fergosi. And I told Bob Sheffing, who was the general manager, I wouldn't trade Leroy Stanton for Jim Fergosi. I didn't know that Ryan was in on the deal till I picked up the paper. To this man. I wonder what Sheffing thought about that. But anyway, that was the way it is. So when I look back to the way the game was played then and the way the game is played now, and how we baby pitchers, and we start babying him in Little League. I had a grandson that was playing, pitching Little League. And in five innings, he had uh, 15 strikeouts and a no-hitter, and they took him out. And my son-in-law was a pitching coach for that team. And I said, well, why would you take him out? He had 53 pitches. 53 pitches with 15 strikeouts, five innings, pretty damn good, I thought, you know. I said, I used to pitch at 8 o'clock in the morning till 6.30 till supper. My mother would call me. I'd pitch all day. How many pitches do you think I threw in a day? So we start baby him in Little League, and then they get in high school, and they only can start once a week now, or they can pitch three innings and maybe two more in some other game that week. And then we get them in the pro ball, and we give them a million-dollar bonus anywhere, the first 30 guys now all ended up with uh, anywhere from two and a half million to 900,000 before they've ever played an inning. And we get the good arms in the minor leagues and we can't let them pitch over 100 innings because all the agents say their arm is growing and we're gonna hurt them and all that stuff. And uh, so 
Now we bring them to the big leagues, and they talk about their great arms, their 98 mile an hour fastballs. Oh, you can't pitch him over 160 innings. What the hell is going on? Are we that smart? Why can we take Dolan Ryan and we draft him in the 16th round of A, 500 and something in the country, and he threw a hundred, I know we didn't have guns then, but I had him out of high school. Wild, a white uh, building in center field at Marion, Virginia. He pitched one time, I thought he was gonna kill somebody because they couldn't see that background. And I made him, made a move into Greenville. First year out, I think he pitched uh, 200 innings out of high school. Struck out, I think it was 250 guys. And he, uh, next year, uh, at the end of the year, I was coaching, it was 66, and uh, he came up and he wasn't ready. But when you think about Nolan Ryan, for his career, and he's got 5,000 strikeouts, more than anybody else. He averaged 157 pitches per game. So if pitch count is so important, why was he able to do that? Why was he able to pitch at 42 years old against his son, who was a sophomore at Texas University? And Nolan's 42, he's throwing 97, and his son's 19, and he's throwing 82. <laughs> so all of these theories we got and how we baby them, I, here's the way I feel. I don't believe in pitch count. I believe when a pitcher goes out there to pitch, he's got his rhythm, and he's throwing the ball nice and easy with all his rhythm. Pitch count don't mean anything. But I do think when he goes out there, and he's laboring and he's struggling and he's getting three and two and over every hitter and this is what's wrong with the dh rule which they're talking about now implementing all throughout baseball i do think that's when they get hurt when you let them out there when they're laboring and they're not throwing well don't worry about the pitch count get them out of there i, I really believe that i'm correct when i say that and that's the way i believe but i look at some some of the old records when i go to cooperstown and I, I get the book out. They give you a book of all the Hall of Famers. Jack Chesbro one year, 45 complete games. 45 complete games. How many, and he only had 34 complete games the next year, and they cut his salary. <laughs> hey, was the guy in the big leagues this year, I don't even know who it was. Four complete games led the major leagues. That's a joke. And you know, when I, I just been in Cooperstown the last two years, Maddox went in, Schmoltz went in, Glavin went in. Great guys, good guys, all good golfers, which all starting pitchers are, because they only have to pitch every fifth day. They're playing golf every morning when they don't pitch, I know. But the big thing is, if pitching always beats good hitting, how can the Atlanta Braves win 14 straight division titles and only win one World Series. So don't tell me that good pitching always beats good hitting. But I think the problem there was they didn't have a Bruce Suter, a Todd Worrell, or something like that. So the game now is changed. The game now is just different than it used to be. And the players often aren't having as much fun. And every place I go, and you see that beautiful picture on the program, that was taken in 1980. That's why I look like I look. People want to know how old I am. I said, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I, I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you something. I remember when grass was something you cut, coke was something you drank, and you used to get married to live together. And I said, now figure out how old I am. And it's amazing how close they come within five years of how old I am. <laughs> but anyway, it's nice talking to you old timers. I have enjoyed coming up here. If you all got any questions, you want to open it up. Do you have a time limit or anything? Because I can go on and on. I can tell you some god dang stories. And, uh, I really enjoyed coming up here. And you're a wonderful group of people. I know I got about 400 more programs to sign. <laughs> hey.
see these guys are easy. All right. Do we have any questions? We got time for about three or four questions. Why? Yeah, you can go ahead and sit down. You can answer from there. Yeah, what's your question? Best hitter you ever saw, Whitey? Well, uh, the best hitter I ever saw, and I played six years against him, was Ted Williams. And uh, the best player I ever saw for one year was Mickey Mantle, 1946, uh, 56, uh, when he won the Triple Crown. I never seen a player play that well. He's the strongest guy in the league. The fastest guy in the league was a great outfielder, and Bill will tell you that. But he didn't take real good care of himself. Uh, I got to know Mickey real well because when I went to Yankees, uh, we were both center fielders. We shagged balls, and we were both the same age. He was a week older than I was. I remember uh, he and I uh, were uh, pallbearers for Maris's funeral. And uh, I got up there on Thursday, and the wake was on Friday. The funeral was Saturday in Fargo, North Dakota. Chill index was seven below zero when we took the casket to the gravesite. And I'm walking in front of Mickey. And here's one of my best friends. We had uh, Billy Martin, Hank Barr, Johnny Blanchard, and Mickey, and me and Bob Allison. We were the pallbearers. I'm walking in front of Mickey. It's cold, and he's got a glass of scotch in his hand. <laughs> and he said under his breath, I'm my best, well, Roger was one of my best friends. He said, Roger, you SOB. You live in Gainesville, Florida. What in the hell are you doing up here, getting buried up here? He said, I knew you would screw me one more time. Before <laughs> and I'll never forget that. But in answer to your question, I'm getting worse than Casey. When you look at what Ted Williams did, and I was playing center field and he's last at bat in 1962, um, in, uh, I was playing for Baltimore. We were in Fenway Park, and he hit a home run. I think he hit 380-something at that age, and he didn't beat out any hits, and he didn't hit any balls to the left of second base. And uh, he got to second base. He waved to the fans. He got to third base, and he stopped, and he spit at the press box. He hated the writers. <laughs> and he went on, crossed home, played into the Fenway Park runway, and you never saw him again. Uh, but just think about this record. He's the last hitter to hit 400, and he played the last day of the season when they wanted him to not play because he was hitting 401. And he said, no, I'm playing a double header. And he won 8 for 10 to finish uh, with a 408 average. He went into service in 42, 43, 44, 45. Four prime years, came back in 46, and he led the league in hitting again. In 1948, after he come back from World War II, he broke a collarbone at the All-Star break in July, so he missed a half a season. Now that's four and a half years. The Korean War started in the early 50s. Because he was in the Marine Reserves and because he had the eyesight, him and Jaeger, the guy that broke the sound barrier, and two of the pilots that were recalled as Marine pilots for the Korean War because there wasn't radar. And they could say had the eyesight of one out of every 10,000 people. That's how good they could see. But Williams ends up playing in the toughest ballpark for a left-hand hitter to hit home runs in the major leagues in Fenway. And he hits 570 home runs. And he missed six and a half years of his career in service and everything. So when people say about Ted Williams, when you put a bat in his hand, man, he was something. The umpires would never call a strike on him because he was better than they were. <laughs> I, had a game in Fen I had a game in Fenway Park against the Red Sox, and Charlie Berry was behind the plate, and Charlie Berry would say hi to the ground keepers. He would talk to everybody. And, you know, you come to bat, I was leading off for the Washington Centers, and, uh, hi, Whitey, how you doing? How's your family? Everything okay? Now, you just keep talking to you. And that particular day, I'm leading off, and I had four walks, and I came up in the ninth inning. And, uh, hi, Whitey, he said, yeah, he said, you have a good winner. I said, okay, Charlie. And Tom Brewer, who had a good curveball, was on the mound, and a 3-2 pitch. I had walked the first four times, and I would have been the first guy in the Maryland League to get five walks 
not intentional, in a nine inning game. The god dang ball bounces in the dirt and Charlie says, strike three. <laughs> Close me out. I said, Charlie, you know the trouble with you umpires? You give Ted Williams five strikes and me two. <laughs> so, but that's the way it was. We had a good time. We read comic books. We had just a good time. We didn't make much money. I remember when I got inducted to Cooperstown and uh, I had a card show on Monday after being inducted on Sunday. I stayed there five hours. I signed 44 dozen baseballs that day. And I made more money at that card show than I ever made in one season playing baseball. <laughs> so that can kind of tell you how good I was. <laughs> uh, see what I said about Casey saying to talk 15 minutes, you don't get in any trouble. <laughs> we got another question real quick. Anybody else with a question? Yeah, in the back. Can you scream it out, please? The Sandberg Suter game at Wrigley Field, right? Sandberg Bruce Suter. Yeah, well, you know, I made this statement after that game. But let, let me explain something. Uh, Doug Harvey uh, went in the uh, Hall of Fame the same day I did, and I didn't get along very good with Harvey. And I understand that Walter Olson didn't either because we called him God, and he wouldn't listen to weather reports, and he'd look at the sky. I mean, he was something. And then he gave you this shot. He wanted to talk to you. And I said, get the hell out there. I wouldn't talk to him. Anyway, <laughs> Harvey was behind the plate. Now, I'm not asking Sarah Grace because Ryan Sandberg was one hell of a ball player. And they got him from the Phillies in a deal that they all, you know, when they traded the Jesus. But the big thing was, the guy before Sandberg hit, The right fielder and we had in the three two pitch to Moorhead with two outs and nobody on was strike three right down the pipe and Harvey called it ball four and the wind was blown out to left and Suter got a split finger got to give Sandberg credit wasn't that bad a pitch it was below the waist and he hit it up on the left field line to tie the game in the ninth and then he won it in the eleventh with another home run but really, the game should have been over. I never did say it that, but uh, it made Sandberg famous. And when the press came in, all the Chicago press, and we got that little cubby hole for a manager's office in Wrigley. I know they got new dressing rooms now. That was the first thing. And I said, well, he's, he's a Hall of Fame ball player. And uh, of course, that made headlines when I said that right away. But he, is, he was a Hall of Fame ball player. Bill, you tell him, he's, he was a heck of a player. Yep. But that was it. But got to give him credit. He's the only guy that ever did two home runs off of Bruce Sutter in a ball game. One more. Anyone? One more? Yeah, over here. Wonderful. I'll get you. I'll get you. One, more, one more. Better player, Ozzie Smith or George Brett, when you were managing? Well, you know, once again, I'm getting a little bit like Casey. Uh, when I'm in Kansas City, when they say, who was the best ball player you ever managed, I say, George Brett. And when I'm in St. Louis, who's the best ball player you ever managed, I say, Ozzie Smith. And when I'm in Columbia and they ask me, I say, George Brett and Ozzie. <laughs> so, they were both great. Uh, the reason I'm here talking to you tonight that I was fortunate enough to get to manage both of them. And I wouldn't be here if George Brett didn't play for the Royals and I didn't make the trade for Ozzie Smith. And uh, both of them were great. Both of them were better with the fans than any two players I ever managed. They never left the ballpark, and they took care of all the kids every night. And I still, of course, I see Ozzy all the time. But uh, uh, George Brett, I would say, of all the ball players I ever managed, he and I stay in touch. Uh, once a month, we talk on the phone. And I threw out the first ball when the Cardinals went in there May 14. George spent the afternoon with me. Set in my box and everything, and uh, wonderful guy, wonderful ball player, and uh, I was very fortunate to get to manage him. He really, a, really a great player. Okay, Whitey, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Whitey Herzog.
before we let you go, just uh, one final announcement. Uh, Mark Smith is the head baseball coach at Providence Catholic High School. Is Smitty still here? I saw him earlier. One thing we did not mention tonight, Providence has won two consecutive state best, uh, baseball championships. So let's give a round of applause to Mark Smith from Providence Catholic. Two straight 4A titles. Thanks for coming tonight, Schmitty. And Jake Ziesmer, you need to come seize me. see me. Thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see you next year.